The research is about um, the contribution and the challenges of English scholarship uh, in a comparative perspective. So I compare Netherlands, uh, South Africa, and the US. Uh, but focusing on the case of refugees and refugees' inclusion. So I have been doing research for the last 10 years uh, about refugees' inclusion. So I have collected narratives of refugees about their, uh, yeah, their, their way they see their, their new life, uh, their identities uh, developing, their sense of connectedness or disconnectedness with a new country they, they live in. Uh, their, their stories and narratives about the, their inclusion or not inclusion in the organizations uh, that they have been applying or working in. Um, so I have organization studies, um, kind of literature and, and publications on the refugees inclusion, more anthropological, sociological uh, discussions on the individual level, but also discussions in the societal, societal level all that discourses on, on refugees and migrations in, in Netherlands, but also um, in the US. I have written some text about that. So in these 10 years, um, I found out that, that is, I was thinking about what is actually, what, what, what I have learned of all these studies and publications on the topic. Um, and I, I found out, especially in the Netherlands, and um, in, in the Netherlands as a welfare state society, uh, the main contribution of there is, I have to say it differently, is that the main the main aspect that came to the fore, which was quite puzzling in the beginning, but later I thought this is really something we have to do research more research about, is that in spite of all the of all the efforts by the policymakers by the organizations to include refugees mm -hmm. in the society and in their organizations actual inclusion did not happen that much. We have a high level of uh, unemployment, a high level of uh, health issues by refugees. Um, even the refugees who do very well in, in learning the language and having had higher education, they still are not very satisfied with their place in the organizations uh, or in society. So the question was, how come? And, and then I started with this theoretical assumption that exclusion of refugees in, in societies such as the Netherlands, the welfare state societies, do not happen only based on the uh, explicit kind of exclusion, that people do not want people. But it's more about the subtle forms, that subtle and invisible forms of exclusion, which has to do with the images and not, to do, not so much with the intentions. So people who want to include refugees policymakers, organizations, they say we want them, but they have a certain image of refugees as people who have shortcomings. So what we call the discourse of lack, that they are lacking something uh, to be able to be part of the uh, uh, yeah, the kind of uh, employee or normal employee that they expect of the employees to be. So they focus all the time on the lack. So what happens in that fixation of seeing the shortcomings? Refugees, especially first-generation refugees who have some visible lack in terms of access or in terms of different kind of, you know, being part of different kind of cultural background. So they are considered constantly of having lacks and their talents, which is somehow somehow somewhat hidden, is not doesn't come to the fore because of the fixation on the lack. Mm -hmm. So if the good intentions without reflection on these images uh, which are fed constantly by the dominant discourse uh, in, in the societies, then doesn't lead to actual inclusion. So the, and I, I thought, I, I have been also from my own um, research very much engaged as an engaged researcher to, to have different kind of discussions with the organization, but also really try to understand what are the actions needed to create inclusion when the intentions are positive? So we have to really also have positive results. So in that process, something is missing. That's the mind mindset, the images. So how can you unsettle those images through research? Um, I 
have been uh, I have to go to 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 go back to my dream or kind of idea I had of who I wanted to become. Mm -hmm. I was as a young girl active in Iranian Revolution in 1979, a long time ago. And um, when the revolution happened, there was this uh, great meeting, uh, uh, gathering in the University of Tehran. And 2,000 uh, people attended the meeting uh, of a scholar, a historian, uh, um, a female uh, professor, uh, who was also an activist. So she talked about, uh, it was uh, for Women's International Women's Day, 8th of March, and she talked about uh, women's emancipation and the importance of equality and justice for women. But she combined her scholarship of history, in talking about the history and, and uh, historical you know, perspective on the issue, combined this scholarship with, uh, with activism. And I was quite impressed. I thought, oh, that, that is impossible to be a highly respected scholar and also really being your feet in the, in the field and, and, and doing uh, real change, try to contribute to change. So she became my role model. And later on, when I started here, um, as a refugee, studied anthropology, and um, and also uh, saw myself as was my dream to become a kind of engaged scholar that not only does the scholarship uh, as separate, not completely separate, but in a more engaged way, so really together with stakeholders of society to try to not only bring knowledge, but also to co-construct and co-generate knowledge together. Um, so I have been doing that in small scale, as I mentioned, because the, the finances were very limited. So mm -hmm. I have been doing that on local level, with small groups uh, of stakeholders uh, in the past uh, 10 years. Now I have the chance to really create a volume around, uh, around this kind of research. Uh, so uh, my dream has been realized for some part before this grant, but this grant gives me the opportunity to bring it much further, to deepen it, to broaden it, and, and, and also to uh, make it more durable, sustainable. Mm -hmm. I, I, I talk about capacity building. We need some kind of capacity building around the refugees' inclusion, mm -hmm. and there, uh, that kind of capacity building means that not only refugees are uh, there to learn, but all the parties have to learn from each other to have this open, to create this open mindset, and to think about inclusion in the practice, uh, in 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 the practice, the, the inclusion in in the you know in the fields that we were talking about real inclusion of refugees. So this capacity building, we have started already with Refugee Academy, uh, which is a co-creation space, uh, bringing professional knowledge, uh, individual knowledge of refugees, and uh, or experience knowledge of refugees, and the academic knowledge together. Um, I had, um, the thing is that I planned my, my sabbatical, which was four years ago, uh, to write this proposal. So I thought, you know, if, if you want to write such a proposal, which is really crucial to, to bring, you know, you have to bring all your knowledge from the past couple of years together and to be also innovative towards the future research. So you, say you, you really have to have enough time to think about it. Um, so I thought sabbatical is a good period, but then uh, in the start of my sabbatical, uh, my mom, who lives in Iran, got sick. Uh, so I left for Iran uh, to be with my mother. She died, she passed away a uh, few, few weeks after that. So my sabbatical actually became, uh, was very important for my uh, healing process. Because losing a mom is always difficult, but losing a mom in distance, from distance that I haven't seen very often in the last couple of years was quite, quite um, um, difficult. So I used that for the healing process, but I didn't have a chance to write my proposal, which was okay. Uh, but a year later, I thought, okay, I have to really write this proposal. I don't have sabbatical anymore, but I, how can I organize that? Um, 
So I, I decided to, uh, I, I'll, there is a writing resort in Greece, and I always sent, uh, uh, have sent my, my PhD students there to finish the, for the last year, last days of the writing, to have this space, uh, reflective space, um, to rethink their proposal, um, the whole research project, and think about the contribution of the research, and have a very nice ending of the fair, of the writing. And bring all these two lines together. Uh, and it has been very helpful. Uh, Artisha is the name of the place. So then this time I thought, maybe I have to go this time I give myself a gift and go. And I tried to make a start. And before that, I got from the department, uh, my department of sociology, some funding for the preparation of the, of the, of the proposal. So somebody, uh, a postdoc, uh, collected some material for me, uh, the literature on the on the issues that were core to the proposal. So I, I had all these things, the material I had, uh, the summaries I had, the discussions I had, and I went for a week to Artisa. A week, and that, that was really literally so. I started the morning with yoga, meditation, that is, and next to the sea, I love swimming, so swimming, and then you know, I wrote every, um, you know, four hours or three hours, one piece of the a paragraph of the proposal, just build it step by step. And yeah, after the six days, the sixth day, I was, I was having a, a draft proposal, uh, which was quite good. I could then use that for discussions with the peer groups and discussing and improving and, and all the other things had to be done. But that was in June and I had to submit it in August. So uh, I had enough, yeah, uh, enough basis to do that. And that proposal was good because as I mentioned, I was the first time I was invited to the interview already. So yeah, sometimes taking time in between the business that we are part of and, and have a good preparation or funding to prepare it because some of the 